to record. Yes, that voice tells you it's being recorded from now. Okay, well, um, well, good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to, um, uh, yeah. So today uh, on on this uh, pediatric teaching, I'll I'll, sh I'll just share my screen. Hang on, there's a couple of people coming in now. I'll just share my screen and we can uh, make a start. Okay, everybody's coming now. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, well, welcome everyone to um, to a, a weekly pediatric teaching. I mean, today I wanted to talk about um, what's often called a neglected tropical disease in children, and uh, I'll just I'll just admit to Dr. Vatuna who's coming in now, and then I'll I'll wait a moment and then make a start. Eh? Okay, well, look, as I said today, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. I, I wanted to talk today about a, what's often called a neglected tropical disease in children, at least the, that's what the World Health Organization call um, soil transmitted helmets. And the, as many of you know, the World Health Organization has this long list now of diseases that they consider to be neglected tropical diseases. And uh, last year when I gave this talk, I talked about lots of different diseases, but this year I thought that there was so much that we, we need to understand about soil transmitted helmets. So I thought we, I'd make this whole teaching session about soil transmitted helmets because they're just, they're just so common and they cause so much illness in, uh, in so many children that uh, it's, it, and, and often we, we don't recognize them. I think we often uh, underestimate the uh, role of helmets infections or infestations in, in uh, children. And uh, I thought it was worth uh, uh, just a, a, a broad session, teaching session about all the different types of soil transmitted helmets. I, I don't know about you, but I found them very hard to, um, uh, to really uh, understand one from another and what the life cycles are and what diseases they cause. And so I'm going to try to give you a, a, an easy way, if you like, of understanding um, the different types of soil transmitted helmets or worms, basically worms in children, and uh, how to recognize them, how to identify them, and the, the types of, um, uh, and, and the, the uh, transmission patterns and other things. So the, just going back to what I mentioned before, that the World Health Organization has a long list of um, neglected, trop what, what they call neglected tropical diseases. And the ones that I've, there's, there's more than a dozen, and the ones that I've highlighted in green are the ones that are relatively common in Papua New Guinea. If you look through them, these, these are uh, infectious diseases are quite common in PNG. And uh, uh, at some stage, we'll talk about these other, these other neglected tropical diseases that are common in, in Papua New Guinea. But today, I just wanted to focus, focus on soil transmitted helmets. Um, but some, some of the other conditions that uh, you'll recognize to be common, yours or Borrelia ulcer or uh, dengue fever or chikungunya virus, uh, even leprosy or lymphatic filariasis, uh, scabies is universally common. Some of these and snake bite, which was recently added to the WHO list of neglected tropical diseases. You can, you can see some of these are common in certain pockets in certain parts of PNG and the Pacific Islands. And some of them are more uh, generally uh, common everywhere, such as scabies and and uh, worm infestation and snake bite and things. Um, so these are the neglected tropical diseases. It's useful to know. As I said, I wanted to focus on um, the common helminth infections or worm infections in children. And uh, I, as I said, I found it quite hard to understand. Well, what's the difference between Ascaris and hookworm or what's the difference between uh, whipworm and uh, um, strongyloides and and there are ways you can understand it and I've tried to describe in this slide that some of the different features and I don't expect you to remember all this from this slide but as we go through the talk I'm going to be talking about each one of these worm infestations and it'll become clear to you what the host and the and the um, life cycle is how they invade the human host like how they invade children what organs are affected and what the clinical manifestations are and what treatments are useful. And this is quite important because for most of the 
worm infestations, albendazole is sufficient, but for some of them, it's not sufficient. Uh, for trichuris, for example, albendazole doesn't work very effectively and you need to use mebendazole. And so in general, um, it, it's useful to understand the soil transmitted helmets in this way, I think, to understand each one of them. I'm going to go through Ascaris lumbricoides hookworm, which in PNG is most commonly Nicata americanus. I'll talk a bit about Cutanea slava migrans, which is uh, sometimes called the dog hookworm, Ankylostoma brazilianus. And I'll talk a bit about Trichuris and its clinical manifestations because they are a bit different to the others. I'll say something about Strongyloides stercoralis and then this rather almost unique um, uh, Strongyloides species to Papua New Guinea, which is Strongyloides fulabornae kellii, which is a, a unusual um, form of Strongyloides that was really just described in, in PNG. So these are very common generally in, in PNG and I, I think it's important that we know about them. So I'm going to start with the Scarus lumbricoides and I've tried to um, draw the life cycle of most of these um, worm infestations so that you can understand how they circulate in the population. Now Ascaris is one, it's a long worm, it's a uh, very long worm, about 15 centimetres in length. And they normally, they live in the, uh, the, the, the Ascaris doesn't have a, an animal host. It's really just humans and fecal oral spread. So just going back to this, Ascaris, the host is uh, humans and the, it invades the host by fecal oral spread by eating contaminated food. And so the worms live in the small intestine and lay many, many thousands of eggs a day and the eggs get um, uh, excreted. And if there is any contamination of soil and if vegetables or other food substances are grown in the soil, then the eggs will uh, um, embryonate and they'll hatch and produce um, uh, worm, worms that uh, then uh, can then, uh, then, uh, then eaten in the, or the, the, the eggs themselves are eaten in, um, uh, in the contaminated food. And then they go through this cycle within the, um, within the body where they're um, uh, swallowed into the gastrointestinal tract. Sometimes there's also a cycle where it passes through the gastrointestinal tract into the lymphatics and the veins, and then back up to, through the, the right, side of the heart and through the lungs and then they're coughed out and and then swallowed and so some some of the uh, uh, some of the manifestations of the um, of the worms are because of the transmission of the um, uh, the larva as they go through the body so it goes after ingestion of the contaminated eggs then the larva hatch in the duodenum then they they, they then penetrate the duodenal mucosa get into the circulation, go to the lungs, they grow, then they're um, in the alveoli, and then be, when they reach a certain size, they get coughed up, and sometimes they get um, cause a blockage of the airways uh, at the level of the epiglottis or the larynx, and then they're swallowed. And, that, and um, uh, so that's the, the life cycle of Ascaris. The children are most commonly infected just because they um, get their fingers contaminated by, uh, by dirt, and they may put their fingers in their mouth and they'll then swallow some, uh, some uh, Ascaris eggs. And, that, and then it goes through that cycle within the, within the gastrointestinal tract and the respiratory tract. And then uh, and, and until you've got mature worms in the, in the gut. So you need to know something about the cycle of Ascaris. You need to know that it's only got a human host. And you need to know the way it transmits through the body so that you can understand the different clinical manifestations of, of, of Ascaris. So just to summarize, it's a large round worm. I said about 15 centimeters, but sometimes they can be even longer, up to 30 centimeters. It is what we call migratory. So it's, it migrates throughout the body. It can cause, because it's of its size, it can cause mechanical obstruction to the small bowel and the intestine. And because of anything that obstructs the, you know, appendiceal aperture can lead to appendicitis. Sometimes it can obstruct other apertures in the gastrointestinal tract, like the bile duct leading to, to uh, jaundice or cholangitis or the pancreatic duct, the ampulla ovata leading to pancreatitis. And sometimes because the, uh, the larva migrate throughout the uh, up, uh, up, uh, coughed up, 
um, from the alveoli into the the uh, the pharynx and then swallowed, it can cause laryngeal obstruction. And some of the manifestations are because the the scarus can initiate an allergic response. So it's like having an allergy or anaphylaxis where there's a, um, a, a type 1 IgE medi mediated eosinophilic pneumonia. So what's sometimes called Loeffler's syndrome, or it's essentially a pneumonitis where there's um, a, a bronchospasm and wheeze, and it's a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction affecting the lungs. And so occasionally you, and you see children who've got um, uh, uh, severe asthma, if they've got patchy change on their chest x-ray and they've got eosinophilia, you perhaps should think of a scarus, uh, um, a scarus infection. Generally speaking, though, most children with a scarus uh, have malnutrition um, because the worms use up all the energy in the gastrointestinal tract, of course. They present with edema, uh, anemia, a pot belly, typically. Um, that, that's the usual presentation with Ascaris. Um, the, the risk factors for having Ascaris are clearly that there's contaminated soil around and sometimes when the sewage is put on the garden or close to the garden, um, then uh, as fertilizer or something, the, then the uh, gardens get contaminated. Young children, as I said, are most affected because they put soil in, often put soil in their mouth or their fingers in their mouth after they've, before they've washed their hands. And, and, and if um, fruits are not cooked or ve vegetables are not cooked properly or washed or peeled uh, appropriately, then, then uh, the eggs can be contaminated on the food. Um, the, as I said, the eggs are in the stool. Sometimes there's eosinophilia. That is when you look on the full blood examination, you see that eosinophils seem unusually high. And you really only see that in allergy, worm infestation, asthma, those types of things. The treatment is albendazole and, and generally speaking, give mebendazole as well, because often if people have one worm, they'll have another worm. This is a, uh, a photograph of a series of Ascaris worms that Professor Vince sh showed me one, one time. He'd collected or some a, a patient had come in. Uh, you can see how extensive the, uh, the worms are from, from this particular patient. You can, Imagine this would just block up your gastrointestinal tract, eh? So, uh, so that's mm. Ascaris. It's good to know about the, as I said, the life cycle of Ascaris, the clinical manifestations. Hookworm is a little bit easier to understand. And some of these worms, there's a, a life cycle where it just involves fecal oral spread. And, and some of these worms, there's a life cycle that involves penetration of the skin. And, and hookworm is one type of worm where there's penetration, skin penetration of the larva. And uh, hookworm is incredibly common in, in uh, many, most populations actually. Uh, uh, it's been estimated in studies that uh, more than half of all the child population in PNG have been in, infected by hookworm. There's two types of hookworms that um, cause uh, clinical features of hookworm, but only one is found in PNG, Nocata americanus, Anglostoma uh, duodenale is rarely or not found in PNG. And this worm, it penetrates the skin um, with its, uh, it, it's a very small, um, the larva are very small, like uh, 500 microns is half a millimeter. And, but it has a pointy tail that can penetrate the skin. And it usually will penetrate the skin if there's cuts in the skin or there's, um, uh, it, it sometimes gets into the hair follicles uh, on the, on the on the base of the um, uh, the hands or the feet, um, and uh, or if there's generally speaking, if there's a cut in the skin, um, the, uh, the the worm can get in, uh, the larva can get in, and it travels then through all the worms that go through a, a phase where they get in through a cut in the skin or a breach in the skin. They travel through the subcutaneous tissues, like through the the skin into venules, which are the tiny veins or the lymphatics. And, and the, as you know, all of those, those uh, vessels lead back to the right side of the heart. So eventually those vessels lead from lymphatics or small venules lead to the inferior vena cava if it's in the lower limbs, for example, and back to the right side of the heart. Then they go to the lungs through the pulmonary artery, then get into the pulmonary capillaries, and then again to the alveoli and the airways and then tr the trachea and they're coughed up into the pharynx and then swallowed and then they reach the small intestine. So that's how hookworm reaches the, 
the um, uh, reaches the gut of, uh, of of children who are infected. Um, I just again tried to draw it. My drawings are not very good, but maybe you can you can see um, that um, the uh, uh, um, humans are the only host of hookworm. Uh, this this type of hookworm, the Nicarta americanus, and the eggs are excreted in feces. If the eggs are um, uh, then the eggs are in sand or soil, they become uh, they hatch into larva. The I'll just admit someone else now. They hatch into larva. Initially, the rhabdotidiform larva, which um, doesn't doesn't infect humans, but then that can transform into the filarial larva in the environment. It just transforms in the environment, and then it, it, if it contaminates the soil or the sand, then uh, uh, if, if a child steps on uh, 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 an infected area of uh, ground, then uh, without shoes on, then uh, it can the uh, worms, those tiny little um, pointy end of that half a millimeter worm, can get into the uh, into the skin. And then remember, it goes through the ve the venules to the in the lymphatics, either the lymphatics or the venules, and then it goes up to the veins, the right side of the heart. Then from the right side of the heart goes to the pulmonary arteries. Then the then the then the uh, pulmonary capillaries, and then gets through to the across the the um, the lung barrier between the alveoli and the capillaries, and then it gets into the alveoli, and then the bronchi, and then the trachea, and then because the the worms the uh, the larva then get coughed up and then swallowed, uh, and then uh, lodge in the in the usually in the small intestines for intestinal hookworms. So it's a it's a um, you just need to know what the life cycle is of these of these worms. Mature hookworms they sit in the small intestine usually and they can extract a relatively small amount of blood. You might think that 0.05 mils per day for any one worm, but if you've got hundreds thousands of worms, then they can take a lot of blood from the from the from the gastrointestinal tract each day. Um, the the uh, Nicarta americanus is the is the hookworm that's mostly found in PNG. This other one, Ankylostoma duodenale, is not found in PNG. But that the reason to mention is because it takes much more blood. I mean, four times as much blood it can extract a day. But if you've got enough of the hookworms, then they can they can make you anemic. So children with hookworm present with anemia or poor growth, sometimes hypoalbuminemia, and they that as well as extracting blood, they can lead to leakage of the gastrointestinal mucosa so that albumin and proteins are just leak out into the, um, uh, into the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. So these children sometimes have what you would consider a protein losing enteropathy because of the, the worms are just sit, uh, sitting there just extracting uh, serum and, and, uh, and blood all day. Um, children have abdominal pain and sometimes diarrhea and because of the, I think because of the nutritional deficiency and, uh, and iron deficiency, these kids often have um, uh, developed some cognitive impairment. So if your child's very heavily uh, infected by hookworm, they can be, um, they can, uh, it can impair a lot of aspects of their life, their growth and development. They often have vitamin A deficiency as well because the worms use vitamin A for growth. Um, the, the diagnosis is clinical. So if you see a child with poor growth and low you know, edema, low albumin, abdominal pain, grumbling, chronic abdominal pain, some diarrhea, um, or they're just not, they're failing to thrive, then you need to treat them for hookworm. The, the diagnosis is clinical. And sometimes you can see the over in the stool, not always, but sometimes. The treatment is to replace the iron, um, uh, ferrous sulfate, that this is what these kids need. They need ascorbic acid to increase iron absorption. And of course they need the anti -helminth. So albendazole is usually sufficient, um, but uh, all children with hookworm, well, they may have another type of uh, worm that won't as respond as well as hookworm to albendazole. So it's good to give them mabendazole and albendazole. And children should wear uh, footwear, not, not just uh, flip-flops, but something that protects them from I'll just let another couple of people in. A, a, some form of footwear that protects them from uh, um, uh, worms uh, invading there through breaches in their skin, because we all have little, tiny little um, cuts in our skin at times in our in our feet or in our hands. 
This is another type, the, the next, so we talked about um, Ascaris lumbacoides, and we've talked about Nicata americanus. Um, so Ascaris leading to ascariasis. We've talked about Nicata americanus leading to hookworm in children. So ch um, uh, the common uh, hookworm in children. Uh, I want to briefly mention this other form of hookworm, which is uh, called cutaneous larva migraines. And it, it's not, it doesn't cause intestinal hookworm in children. Uh, it does in dogs and cats but not so much in humans, and I'll explain why. But what it does, what it does cause is this, um, this uh, uh, serpiginous irritation of the skin where the worm is burrowing under the skin. And so if you see a child who's got a skin rash that looks like this, that looks a, a bit uh, what, we, what dermatologists call geographical, you can see it looks like a river or something being um, uh, flowing in, in the skin, then uh, think that most likely this is a worm infestation and most likely it's Ankylostoma resilensis. Now, this is the dog or cat hookworm and, uh, and it causes gastrointestinal, intestinal hookworm in, in, in animals, but not in humans. So this is uh, a bit different. This is the, the life cycle. I've tried to draw it of um, the cutaneous larva migraines, and it's the eggs are excreted by dogs or sometimes cats. And uh, there is a life cycle for this hookworm, this, uh, this, this worm that involves both dogs and involves humans. And the, uh, the, the uh, dogs excrete the larva, they then, um, they then mature to become uh, the um, uh, dogs excrete the eggs, I should say, and they, they then hatch and mature to become the larva. And then the larva can penetrate through the hair follicles in the skin or breaches in the skin. And that the, the manifestations are a sort of tingling itch, a really excruciating, very painful itch that migrates. It migrates quite slowly, like maybe a millimeter a day uh, at most, uh, a millimeter every two or three days. Um, it's quite a slow moving worm, but it causes intense, intense itch. Um, it's, uh, it's unlike other hookworms, it doesn't get any deeper because it can't penetrate through the, the um, outer layers of the, the skin through the, into the dermis. It can't, oh, sorry. it can't penetrate through the basement membrane of the skin. So the larva usually stays um, uh, within the epidermis. This is cutaneous larva migraines, it, it, different to um, uh, hookworm due to Nicata americanus. The, the typical places where you see the rash are obviously the, in the feet, uh, sometimes the toes, the hands, the knees, if someone's been kneeling down on contaminated soil, or even the buttocks if they've been sitting on uh, contaminated uh, uh, soil or contaminated ground. It, it, it's, um, it's particularly... Uh, the, this uh, this um, this worm particularly is is at the beach on sandy soil. The worm tends to maybe because people don't wear um, often don't wear shoes when they're at the beach, and it can get through the uh, breaches in the skin. The treatment is a single dose of albendazole, um, just one dose, and usually the uh, the uh, the larva are dead. Um, the uh, the alternative treatment is ivermectin, which is another. Um, uh, anti-helmet and uh, anti-scabies drug, which uh, is sometimes quite quite useful, but but a single dose of albendazole will usually do it, and and usually you get quite rapid relief within uh, two days. Um, the the itching, which was really severe, is usually gone, and most of the lesions or tracts in the skin resolve within a week. Um, but uh, so one dose of albendazole, and but again, if a person's got um, cutaneous larva migraines, they may well have some other form of uh, worm infestation too. So I tend to give them mebendazole as well. Now, the next worm, so we've talked about, just to recap, we've talked about um, uh, Ascaris lumbricoides causing ascariasis. Um, we've talked about um, a human hookworm, um, that is Nicata americanus, and we've talked about um, uh, uh, cutaneous larva migraines, uh, which is um, a bit fr from Ankylostoma brasilensi. And uh, again, they all have different life cycles. 
and uh, they all have slightly different manifestations. So I'll go back to the first slide I showed at the start, where it's it you can help to it can help you to uh, learn how to recognize the different manifestations. The the next worm I wanted to talk about is called Trichurus trichuria, and and this again has a the reason why this is an important worm is it has a different uh, sort of manifestations, and that and that is partly because most of the phase, most of the um, the worm phase is actually in the large bowel. It's um, most of the infection occurs in the large bowel, but the uh, the life cycle of this worm is a bit like um, uh, Ascaris. It doesn't involve an animal host, but the um, uh, a person, uh, a human, excretes the worm in, uh, excretes the eggs in uh, in stool, and then the eggs mature usually in the soil. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Oh, it's Trevor Duke speaking. That's right. Okay, so the the uh, an infected human <laughs> excretes the eggs in the uh, in their stool, and that can just like with um, Ascaris will. In, uh, infect or contaminate the ground. Uh, on the ground, the uh, on infected soil, the uh, worms um, uh, uh, mature and uh, and then hatch. And usually, it's the eggs that are actually ingested. The the eggs of the um, uh, the, the trichurus are ingested usually in contaminated uh, food. And then the eggs hatch in the small intestine, but do all their main uh, damage in the large intestine. It's the, the eggs hatch into larva that then form worms and they get infected in the large intestine, very low in the large intestine, usually in the cecum or the colon or the rectum, particularly in the rectum. And uh, then the worms excrete their eggs in the stool and the cycle goes around again. But because the, the worm mostly infects the large bowel, the, the manifestations are um, a bit different to other types of worms, and they particularly cause bloody diarrhea, a, co a colitis. Um, uh, so they also cause anemia, just like hookworm, and, and they and they cause wasting. But the characteristic feature is rectal pro prolapse. And if you see a child who's got a rectal prolapse, then most likely they've got whipworm or or trichurus trichuria, and uh, a. a a rectal prolapse can look like this. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, ch children who've got rectal prolapse. They have. It can be. It, it can occur because if you've got severe, if a child's got severe wasting and uh, um, uh, a severe malnutrition with with chronic or persistent diarrhea and buttock wasting, that you can get rectal prolapse. But typically, um, uh, children will also be infected with whipworm. As I said, the adult worms, they live in the large bowel in the cecum or the colon or the rectum, uh, and they cause rectal prolapse and bloody diarrhea, um, uh, sometimes uh, dysentery um, uh, and iron deficiency anemia. Uh, again, if you see a child who's got um, uh, dysentery and rectal prolapse and eosinophilia, then you really, that's the clinical diagnosis of uh, whipworm or trichurus trichuria. And, and it's important to know these these, uh, I suppose, the clinical syndrome that these worms present with, um, because they uh, they can be easily treated. The, the, this this worm is important because albendazole alone won't treat uh, whipworm very well. It, about half of the patients are cured, but half of them uh, relapse and uh, or or are, or the symptoms persist. So you really need to use mebendazole, and you need to use it for three days. So I would again. If a child's got one worm, then treat them with both mabendazole and albendazole um, uh, so that you're treating it all. Uh, rectal prolapse can be a very painful uh, um, uh, uh, problem in children, but until you treat the, the whipworm, usually it won't resolve. Um, okay, so we've talked about, just to recap, I'll just go back perhaps to the start to recap. We talked about Ascaris lumbricoides, the the cause of ascariasis in children, remembering that the humans are the are the only host of that um, that worm that they that fecal oral spread, and it comes from eating contaminated food. And remember that life cycle within the body leads to infection of the intestines and the airways and the lungs, sometimes the upper airway obstruction. We talked about hookworm or Nakata americanus, 
the worm where you've got, again, humans are the only host and it's skin penetration. And most of the damage that is done by hookworm is in the small intestine leading to blood loss and anemia. And we talked about the dog or cat hookworm, the cutaneous larva migrans, and that really just causes skin irritation, that terrible itchy rash that children can get. And, we talk, and, and now we've talked about whipworm or trichurus trichuria. And again, this, this only has a human host. It's in, there is just fecal oral spread through eating contaminated food. And it's the large bowel that, where, that is most affected, leading to um, colitis, bloody diarrhea, dysentery, and rectal prolapse. So I, I think there's a, there are clinical differences between each of these worms, and it's important that we try to understand them. The last worm I'm going to talk about is Strongyloides stercoralis, and that is also very common in PNG. Um, and so I'll just go into that bit. Strongyloides, you know, about a quarter of all children in PNG are, are, are positive for Strongyloides um, when uh, when uh, when serological tests have been done, and maybe up to 80% in children under one year of age, depending on where they are. There are certain parts of PNG and the Pacific Islands where strongyloides is, is, uh, is re a really common uh, uh, infection. It, it, strongyloides has a, a complex life cycle. I've talked a bit about worms that only have a human life cycle, worms that have a, a human and an animal life cycle. Well, strongyloides has everything. It has a... Um, a life cycle involving um, uh, dogs and other animals, um, but it also pen can penetrate through the through the skin. So unlike some other worms there, where they involve a, a, the the host is a dog, they can also penetrate through the skin and they can penetrate through the intestines. So it's a very migratory worm, and sometimes it, a bit like cutaneous larva migrans, when you see that. Um, that same itchy rash, that uh, geographical rash that looks like a, you know, a raised river that's extremely itchy, and it's going a bit faster, then that's um, uh, that's uh, strongyloides. It 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 um, is a a faster migratory worm, and uh, it can penetrate both through the skin and the intestine, and uh, it it the infection can come from. Um, uh, uh, but both and what's called an auto infection of of uh, of already infected people, and it's been shown that sometimes there's this um, constant auto infection that can go for uh, 20, 30, 40 years. And there was uh, certainly the most, I suppose, famous example of that was in um, uh, very elderly people uh, who are a bit prone to a recurrence of strongyloides. Um, it was clear that. Um, uh, many of the World War I, World War II uh, soldiers who um, uh, fought in the Pacific, even when they were in their 70s and 80s, got recurrent strongyloides. So it's something the uh, strongyloides can stick around for a long time um, uh, and and cause infection. Uh, most, however, most sort of uh, of these worms are really trivial. You can have a um, strongyloides uh, worm infection and 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 it almost doesn't cause any problems at all. Um, but mm -hmm. Uh, and unless the person becomes immune compromised. And I think that's why there was um, some years ago among the World War II veterans, there was a lot of elderly people getting strongyloides infection because they had become immune compromised with, with age. Um, now, as I say, most strongyloides infection doesn't cause any problems, but it can cause this, um, this itchy eruption or migrating lesions in the skin, this cutaneous larva currents, it's fast migrating, unlike the, the dog hookworm the, the, um, uh, that I mentioned before. And sometimes because of the, um, the migrating aspect of the worm, it can cause cough and wheeze and cause abdominal pain or diarrhea and, and a, a malabsorption syndrome, and it can cause weight loss. So, I mean, it's similar in a way to Ascaris lumbricoides in, in its manifestations. The other, inf the other thing that's a bit similar to Ascaris is that it can cause a, what's called a hyperinfection syndrome, where there's just general systemic uh, inflammation um, from the immune response. So children can get um, diarrhea and a paralytic eyelid. They can look like they've got septicemia. Um, sometimes they can get 
um, pleural effusions or bacterial peritonitis. This was a first patient who had severe strongyloides hyperinfection. And you'd look at this and, and think that the child's got you know, bad pneumonia, but in fact, it was all related to this hyperinfection syndrome from strongyloides with cough and wheeze and, uh, and, and dyspnea and hemoptysis. And sometimes it can even infect the brain. The, the larva can infect the brain. So when you think about strongyloides and Ascaris, you should think about mostly they're asymptomatic and sometimes they can cause a general systemic uh, um, syndrome if the patient, if the person is is immune system is just a bit uh, impaired. The clinical features are, as I said, mostly um, uh, gastrointestinal and sometimes systemic, but when they're gastrointestinal, they cause malabsorption, particularly malabsorption. Um, on the diagnosis can be made just based on clinical grounds, but also if you look at the microscopy, you can see these larva and eggs in the stool um, and uh, and the treatment for strongyloides is albendazole. So three, again, one dose is not enough. Give three doses, um, in, uh, three daily doses of uh, albendazole. That, that's that's um, strongyloides stercoralis. Um, and, uh, and again, quite common in PNG and mostly doesn't cause any problems, but sometimes it can cause, uh, it can cause illness. There's another type of strongyloides that is, is quite common in some parts of PNG. And this was this is called strongyloides fulaborne kellii. And it was a, um, a stronger, there, there, is, there are other forms of strongyloides fulaborne that are found in other countries. But this particular version, uh, kellii, is really only been, um, I'll just admit someone else now, um, has really only been described in PNG, and it causes what's called a swollen belly syndrome. It was initially described in Canabia in Gulf Province in, and, and was also found in Medang. And the, the characteristic feature is that it can be transmitted vertically from the mother to the young infant. And unlike most um, worm infestations, it, you can't really get it from as vertically transmitted infection, but strongyloides fulaborne uh, Kelly, I you can, and it causes this con uh, condition called swollen belly syndrome, where children have a very distended abdomen and uh, uh, sometimes low levels of albumin and uh, and generalised edema. But swollen belly syndrome, due to strongyloides as a vertical transmitted infection, is characteristic in PNG. I wanted to uh, talk a bit about the anti-helminth agents, the drugs we use to treat these helminths. And uh, these have been around for a very long time. Some were initially used in uh, veterinary medicine because, of course, helminths, worms uh, uh, infect animals even more than they infect humans. And so many of these drugs were first developed for um, veterinary use and have then become licensed and refined to be used in humans. Um, the, the first ones were the benzimidabite benzamidomized, which were for in, made in the 1960s. And they were really to treat fungal infection and, and worm infestations uh, um, in animals. Then uh, thiobendazole, which you may have heard about, was the, one of the first human drugs. It's, a, it's still a good drug for some, the treatment of some parasitic infections. In fact, it's only, it's uh, for some types of parasites, uh, you need to use thiobendazole. For most helminths, though, for these these uh, worm infestations, then mabendazole and albendazole will do. There's a couple of other azoles, um, flubendazole and triclobendazole, which really aren't available very much, but mabendazole and albendazole, they cover the, the whole um, range of helminths. The, the, the way they work is usually via what's called a metabolic disruption of the parasite at different sites, mostly at the mitochondria of the, you know, we all have mitochondria that generate energy for our cells. And if, you, if you've got a, uh, a drug that can interrupt the, the parasite mitochondria and it's specific to parasites, then it's, uh, it's a highly effective at killing the, the, um, uh, the larva uh, or sometimes killing the, killing the eggs as well. Albendazole is highly effective and it's broad spectrum. So it covers most of the, the helminths, so these worms that I've talked about. Um, 
And some of them, like hookworm and ascaris, can be treated with a single dose, but some of them you need to give three days of albendazole. So if you've got a patient who's got severe um, uh, worm infestation, then I always treat for three days. And for some of these worms, albendazole is less effective, particularly trichurus. Remember, trichurus is the worm that mostly affects the large bowel, the colon, the the, um, and the rectum causing rectal prolapse and dysentery. And for those children and for most children with worm infestation, you're better off using mebendazole as well as albendazole. So mebendazole and albendazole. There are some other anti-parasitic agents that are sometimes used, metronidazole and tinidazole. And they're mostly anti-protozole rather than anti-helminths. They don't have any effect on, on helminths. Um, and so it's important that we know why we're using these drugs, which ones work in on the helminths, the worms, and which ones work on other parasites. And the, the um, anti-protozoal um, agents like tinidazole and metronidazole, they're very good for, for uh, protozoa like Giardia and Intermeba histolytica and tr Trichomonas and Gardnerella, the reproductive parasites but uh, they're no good for helmets. They won't work on helmets. Of course, metronidazole is, is useful for anaerobes as well, but, but again, it doesn't work on helmets. That's why you need to use albendazole or mebendazole for those, for those agents. Um, I'm sure you know this, but the main um, issue about, all, about, about helmets and the neglected tropical diseases in general are that they are diseases of poverty. And there really is a a, a common cycle that, um, that, that allows these worm infestations and other neglected tropical diseases to, um, uh, to remain uncontrolled. And it's mostly in people who have poor housing or poor sanitation. And so when we're taking histories of, of children about housing and sanitation and water supplies and the way food is prepared, then these are all they're clinically relevant histories because they have some bearing on whether or not a child is at a greater risk of having uh, uh, helmet infections. Um, these infections not only um, arise from poverty, but they can also cause poverty because you know children who have iron deficiency, uh, they also have cognitive impairments, they then have poor school performance, so they don't go to school, they have micronutrient deficiency and wasting and poor development in it. And it's just a vicious cycle of poverty and, and infection. And so it makes sense. Many uh, countries have gone to um, programs of mass drug administration, giving out albendazole with, each, um, uh, with, um, with vaccines. And that's been very effective. Um, and, uh, and some countries have gone to the distribution of my, uh, ivermectin, which also is highly effective against most most helmets um, and, uh, and can eliminate or markedly reduce these uh, worm infestations. Of course, we need other things besides just drugs and we need better public health policies and housing and sanitation and clean water supplies and that sort of thing. And generally economic development, which leads to, which is the reason why our children are less likely to have worm infestations than children who live in very deprived conditions. So. As pediatricians, we need to understand the, the background to why children get um, have these worm infestations and what we can do about it. Of course, our kids can have worm infestations as well, and that's why it's useful to uh, deworm all children, um, I think. So just getting back to what we've learned today, I really wanted to just focus on the on the helmets, on the worm infestations, rather than on the other neglected tropical diseases, which we might talk about at some other stage. But I, I hope this has enabled you to, I'll just admit the NAO here. Um, we're almost finished though. I hope this has enabled you to um, maybe have, get a good understanding of the different types of worm infestations of, we've covered Ascaris, we've covered human hookworm, we've covered cutaneous larva migrans, the dog hookworm, and the whipworm, trichurus, trichuria, and strongyloides. And remember, there's a systemic form of strongyloides. There's a um, and there's a, a form that can be vertically transmitted to, to um, from mother to baby. So um, maybe I'll just go back to the uh, the first the first slide I had because I tried to in that slide tried to summarize the different types of worms. And this is what you know. I think it's useful for us to 
try to make this distinction between the types of worms and understand what the host is of each of the worms and what the cycle is, whether it's just a human uh, environment cycle or whether there's another um, uh, host involved like dogs or, um, or cats and what the type of, um, uh, the, the, the way um, these, these worms or the larva infect humans, whether it's fecal oral contamination or whether it's the skin penetration and which organs are affected, whether it's just the gastrointestinal tract or whether it's just the skin or whether there's something more characteristic like the rectal prolapse you see with trichuris or whether there's systemic, um, systemic features <clears throat> like you sometimes see occasionally with ster strongyloides stercoralis in immune compromised hosts or you sometimes see with Ascaris lumbricoides um, and, and what the treatment is, remembering that most of them are treated with albendazole, but for some it's good if you use mobendazole as well. And some are treated, some are adequately treated with, for one day, but you're probably better off if you can treat for three days um, if you've got a child who's got uh, severe worms. All right, well, I'm not sure whether that's an interesting topic for you or not um, to learn about, but I think we, we all should know a bit more about um, worms because uh, they're just so common and they, they can cause so much disease. So I'm going to stop there. That's, um, that's all I wanted to say today. Um, I'm sorry, some people just came in quite towards the end of the talk. I have tried to uh, record today's talk so we can, um, we can um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send around the recording and you can have a, have a look at it. And I'll also send around the slides. So I'll just stop there and see if anyone's got any questions. Um, I hope that's explained the different types of worms and their manifestations to you.